Well, Mark, welcome. It's great to meet you and, and to have you here in the Fight Week Hotel as you prepare for fight camp this weekend to face the savage Alan Babich, of course. First of all, to have your opportunity here on the big stage, live around the world on zone. how excited and, and, and how happy are you to be here? Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm buzzing about it. It's a brilliant platform to, uh, to showcase on. Um, I'm happy. It's a decent fight. I believe that I can take the win home. And I, I'm a, I'm all in all, mate, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We'll come on to talk about uh, the Savage a little bit later on. Before that, though, I want to get to know a little bit about Mark Bennett and talk about your story, because it's certainly a story worth yeah. telling. Um, taking yourself back, you finish your GCSEs, you join the Army at 16. What was it that encouraged you to, to join the Army and, and make that career choice at such a young age? Yeah, I, just think, I, I was 15 when I first signed up, and I thought, well, what can I do with myself? I just thought, fuck it, let's go. Can I, can I, sorry. Um, I, I was 15 when I first signed up, and then I, I thought, oh, let's have a go. I'll join the Army. Um, went to AFC Arrogate when I was 16 um, and just went with it, mate, and I enjoyed it. I got my driving licence out of it. I got a good, I made some good friends. I had a good career. Um, I was just, it wasn't a childhood dream. It was just something that happened and I went with it, mate, really. Your first tour of Afghanistan was four years later, I believe, after you signed up, wasn't it? How challenging physically, mentally what was that whole experience? Oh, it was, a, I mean, I was 20 years old when I went over to Afghan. Um, Started the PDT, pre-deployment training when I was 19. Um, my missus was pregnant when I went over there, so she was, I had my first scan with my daughter, um, the 12-week scan, then a day later I went to Afghan, and then I come home a week before she was due, um, and then she had her when I got back. But obviously the time away, I was away from the full, first pregnancy at the age of 20, 21. That age in Afghan, I mean, a lot of the lads over there, they're all young anyway. We're all, uh, everyone in the army, realistically, at that point, in the, the ranks, the lower ranks anyway, there was young lads, 18, 19, 20 year olds, and it was, well, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my time over there and I'd do it again. But um, yeah, it was, yeah. To have the birth of your first child at 21, and I believe it was not long after losing your father as well, wasn't it? Lots of family pressures added to a young man's shoulders who was already in a very pressurised situation. That must have been tough for you as well. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, once I was medically discharged, <laughs> my wife, she had t well, my wife now, she, she wasn't then, she had me second daughter. <laughs> I got discharged and then she had her in the January. I was discharged in the December and she had her in January. So we was, I was out on Civvy Street and it was a big pressure. Obviously, like I said, I lost my father at 18. Um, I had me, obviously, I've got my mum still, but she's, uh, she's a big help. She was a big help, she still is. But yeah, it was a big pressure to take on a family and just and be the man. And just just the way to be, though, isn't it? You've got to rise up to the challenge. Made my bed, mate. I make I lie in it, don't I? And I suppose you know the pressures were added when you when you were faced with that medical discharge. Just talk me through that whole process and, and what it was that actually happened. Um, I, well, I was obviously in Afghanistan, um, and I just my ear, while I was over there, my hearing deteriorated. I've lost a percentage of my hearing in my left ear, and um, I've got tinnitus in my right. Obviously, coming back from Afghan, they say that you can't soldier on, you can't do your APWT, your weapon handling. Basically, you've got to pass a test every year by firing your weapon, firing your rifle, um, and I couldn't do that, so they said I couldn't soldier on. And that's where the discharge came from. Um, I mean, at 23, coming out on Civvy Street at that age with obviously a young daughter and one on the way, it was a big it was a big shock, because for me, when I joined the army at 16, I was, I was in it till I was 40. I was living the life, I loved it, you cut me, I bled green. You know, like I was, I was all army, um, but then obviously it was a big shock, and to try and shake up to Civvy Street was a bit. It was, yeah, still trying to manage it now. <laughs> of course, I, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Um, one passion you've always had from a young age is rugby, isn't it? Talk yes. to us about that rugby experience and, and what sort of level you played at as well. Um, well, I was playing rugby for from about twelve years old. My granddad would played for the Wasps on my mum's side, uh, London Wasps. So and obviously it was. It was Put into me. Um, I played through foreign engines, joined the army, played at a, lot, a high level in the army. I pl played against people like Leicester Tigers Academy, um, Worcester Warriors Academy. When I was in the army as well, I played National One for Otley. I was semi professional with that. Um, played at Twickenham for the army warm up game. Um, I played for Combined Service under 23s. Um, I just, yeah, I, I played a lot and I enjoyed it and that was that was what I did. I was, I was quite, to be fair, a lot of people call it a tracksuit soldier. I played a lot of rugby in the army, yeah. Talk to me then about how you found the sport of boxing. I believe it was within your work, wasn't there? There was a, a charity night organised and you thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a go. You ended up winning yeah. that fight in the first 30 seconds. Was it, was it that experience in that first 
fight you had that night, we sort of realised, you know, I, I might be good at I could give this a proper go. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest. So I was, I was stood on the doors with the lads with a bit of extra cash on the weekend um, in Doncaster. Um, and we all, thought, we all thought, oh, we'll sign up for a charity deal. I've always had a, I've always been a bit of a scrapper throughout, like playing rugby. There's always, I mean, rugby's quite a rough game, and it always it ends up turning into a bit of a, a ruck or where, there and here and there. Um, so yeah, I was on the doors. We said, oh, we'll have a, white, we'll have, we'll all sign up to this, this ultra white collar boxing. I signed up to it. I did the training. I trained with a bloke called Neil Malpaz at the time. He was doing the, he's an old heavyweight. He was the old Central Area champion. Um, I was training with him. I went into the fight. I won the fight. Then I went over and uh, started boxing unlicensed and then from there on that was it I just took off I didn't lose an unlicensed fight um, and now here I am now I turned off a professional at 30 I, I was only, I've only been boxing I'm 33 now I've only been boxing six years I mean I'm sat here it's a big achievement I'm, I mean I'm proud of what I've done certainly should be Let, let's talk a little bit about that professional boxing career because it began strongly didn't it you know first three fights you had wins over heavyweight gatekeepers Dorian Darch Camille Sokolovsky as well Heading into the Ultimate Boxer, did you see that as your, your big chance to really burst onto the scene? Oh, yeah. I mean, going into the Ultimate Boxer, I, well, even from turning professional, I mean, I've not, uh, every fight I've been in has been a fight. There's not been, I've not really boxed. I think there's one, my professional debut was against Ferenc Vashlak. He was, he's a bit of a journeyman, but he's, he's been on the scene a long time. And for me to go turn off a professional and then box him on my debut was a, was a, was a, he was a, a lot of experience to what my six, seven fights I had unlicensed. Um, that was a big ask. And then the second fight we went on to box Dorian Darch. I thought, me, I was talking to my manager Joe and my coach Mike and Neil, and we said, yeah, bring it. Let's have it. Let's have him in. Um, let's get on with it. And we did. And I turned him over in two. Um, and then the third was Sokolowski, and it was the exact same. I, I don't want to be in these fights where. I mean, I was selling a lot of tickets. I was selling 100 tickets. And I didn't want my fans coming and watching me just have a move about and just, no, I wanted them to see me have a fight. And that's what they want to come and watch, isn't it? That's great. So I had, um, I bo we bo ended up boxing Sokolowski on my third, Healy on my fourth. And then I think my fifth I boxed, um, it was, I think it was a bit of a journey, man, Miles Willington. But it was because we went into the six, the six rounds, um, you know, like just to push on to that. But yeah, I've had some good fights. I've, I've, Enjoyed it, and then obviously stepped into the ultimate boxer. Well, that, well, I don't know if you've seen it, but there were all fights in there. Like I, I just turned up another tear up. So I went, it's just the way I go, mate. Heading into that ultimate boxer, uh, boxer tournament, you said that losing was one of your biggest fears. You did taste defeat for the first time in a professional boxing ring against Nick Webb, who is here in the hotel. We of course fights this weekend against Fabio Wardley. How did you take that loss, and what positives have you been able to maybe take from it? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, that is one of my fears: is loss, is losing. It's I try, I put myself on a big, on a big structure, on a big platform, and I'm wanting to prove myself as a man. Really, that's what you do when you're fighting, and you're proving yourself, you man, your structure. Um, and to lose, it was my first fight through the unlicensed ranks, through the professional ranks, was the first loss I took. The way it happened, I took it quite well. I'll be honest. Um, Nick won the fight at the end of the day. I think it, the, the, I had an harder night building up to it, um, but it was the fresher man on the fight, in the fight. For the rematch, I'd, I'd like that rematch to happen. I mean, I'll, I've got nothing against Nick. He's a lovely kid, but it's just it's his business, isn't it? And I want to avenge it. But, yeah, um, I, uh, it, was a, it was good. Watching the fights unfold over the last 12 months or so, it's been a strange period, hasn't it, for, for boxing, for the world and for sport. You've had some time out of the ring, coming up to, to nearly two years now. Has that been a time of reflection for you? How, how have you sort of been able to spend the last couple of years? Um, not so much reflection. I've been um, obviously leaving the ultimate box, and then we had a, a fight booked in for the 4th of April on a show at Worksop um, to, get, to get back in winning ways and then, and then go from there. Um, but obviously the lockdown happened, and I've set recently, well, before lockdown happened, I set up my own business. I've, uh, a tarmacker. Um so I've been trying to build that through the lockdown and, I've, and the work's been even we've been constantly busy with that I've been ticking over every now and then but it wasn't really reflecting I was just trying to provide a future for my family and my kids I mean I've got a wife and four kids at home so like I can't just sit sit about moping so yeah
Right, well, that has led you to this point. Um, let's talk about the man in the opposite corner, Alan Babich, the savage. He burst onto the scene uh, last year, actually last summer here at Fight Camp when he boxed Sean Dell Winters. How impressed have you, have you been with the, the sort of rise he's had over the last year and him as a fighter as well? Um, don't get me wrong, he's got good stock. He's, he's 7 and 0, isn't he? So he's, he's doing well for himself. And I, I, yeah, I wouldn't say that impressed. I mean, he's, a decent, he's decent enough, isn't he? But he's, I mean, the way he's been talking about me through this camp, you know, it, it, it's, I let him do him and I'll do me. It's not the way I go about my business. But he, um, he, he's, he's doing well for himself, yeah. And I, I, but I, I believe I'm coming to win, mate. So, yeah, that's all I've really got to say with that, yeah. His last few opponents have talked themselves up, talked about, oh, look, he's one-dimensional, you know, he's made for me. But they've not been able to deal with the sustained pressure that he brings from the opening bell. Why do you believe you are the man to be able to deal with that? Honestly, I've got an hard head. <laughs> no, no, I've, um, I generally do believe that I can. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a lot bigger than him. I'm taller than him. I've got the. I've got. Every, if you look at myself and Bobby next to each other, the statistics for me and him, it's a. You know, like you'd, you'd always you'd lean towards me. I'm, 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 I'll probably be tipping the scales at 19 stone. I'm six foot five. I've got a longer reach. I believe that I can keep him on the back foot and I can push pressure. I'm a pressure fighter as well. If you, if it, well, so I think we're just going to meet in the middle, mate, and it's just going to throw down. And as someone, given the experience you've had in life, arguably your strongest asset is your mental strength. We know what Alan's like. He, he's probably going to try and get under your skin, but you've been there, seen it, done it. There's nothing that he's going to be able to do to phase you, is there, I feel? Oh, no, mate, no. I mean... Mentally, I can't be broke. I mean, when I was 16 during the army, that's what they do. They break it down, break it down, break it down, then they build you up. And then, he, that, yeah, no, he's not going to get, under, he won't get under my skin. Now, like I say, he'll, I'll let him do him and I'll do me, and then we'll deal with it on Saturday night. And for your life, uh, for your career, you know, what a massive opportunity this is to box at fight camp. If you beat Alan Babich, you can change your life, right? Oh, I, I believe so, yeah, as long as um, if I do it in good fashion, well, even if I beat him, yeah, I, I think that. There's going to be people knocking on the door, the phone will keep ringing, and I think that it'll open up a lot of avenues for myself and my family. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I hope. Well, I'm, I'm hoping so anyway. If not, yeah. And this is heavyweight boxing, you know, people want to see knockouts, that's what puts bums on seats. It's an entertainment business, isn't it, after all? Alan, you touched on it earlier, look, he's had a lot to say. He says that you're a step backwards, he believes he wins this fight inside four rounds. What's your version of events when you visualise this fight, you predict this? The outcome of this fight, how does Mark Bennett win on Saturday night? I believe that he's going to come out in the first one to three rounds, first three rounds, throw in as much as he can, and I think he's going to shoot his muck, and I think he's going to blow himself out too early, and I'll weather the storm, and then I'll start putting it on him, and I can see myself stopping him in the fifth or sixth round.